Yeah. Two brewmasters up against each other. All right, so Todd Stevens is going to be on Sun and Moon, currently seventh on our Player of the Year leaderboard, playing against Tian Tan, who is on Abzan Rally. It looks like he's 4 0 1, so he is hmm. technically undefeated. All right, and I believe Tian goes by John, so we'll try to refer to them, for her, refer to him as that name for the rest of the matchup. And, All right. uh, so it looks like John is on a mulligan to six. He's going to lead off on, I believe that is a windswept heath. Shiny, that is one of the, one uh, of the expeditions that yeah. you can get on sale right now on StarCityGames.com. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many other expeditions John has. It looks like he's got a bunch, so it's going to test me on my expedition image knowledge. Yeah. He's going to get an overgrown tomb. And where he doesn't have an expedition, he's got a foil. So this guy's on the... Uh, on the, not only am I going to win, but I'm going to win in style plan. I approve. Right. Todd did just have the modern standout Temple of Triumph yeah. on his turn. He's going to scry. And a lot of people do not like a land that comes into play tapped. But Todd is playing a control deck. He is not playing blue. And so he needs to filter his draw some way or another because Control decks need to worry about flooding out in a way that aggro decks don't. All right, so it looks like we've got another expedition uh, that gives him white mana so he can cast his Voice of Resurgence. And a foil Voice of Resurgence? Oh man, if I was playing against John, I, I wouldn't be able to attack, I wouldn't be able to block, I just, I wouldn't be able to see what's going on, be blinded by the glory of his, of his shiny cards. Yeah. All right, Todd is going to use his Arid Mesa. Looks like that is a Horizon Canopy for John. And to balance things out, I have to admit that Todd has some sweet swag of his own. Those Triforce sleeves are, are pretty sweet. All right, so a, so, a, so a Journey to Nowhere is going to take care of that Voice of Resurgence. Another modern all-star. Another modern all-star. Vault of the Archangel for John Tan is going to bring along with it a Kitchen Finks. So that's going to bring him up to 19. Man, what are we watching? Uh, like other, other modern, than the... Modern magic. <laughs> Games that are not going to end on turn three. <laughs> oh, man. Basic planes for Todd and a pass back. Oh, there's a Rally of the Ancestors for John Tan. Not very good against the Journey to Nowhere deck. Kitchen Finks going to enter the battlefield. You know, this I is... Feel like John Tan's deck is pretty susceptible to Blood Moon if Todd Stevens can ever draw one. Yeah. And John doesn't have um, Birds of Paradise or some of the other mana acceleration that we usually see in these decks. He's a little more committed to a beatdown plan with um, cards like Triad Militant, which is kind of cool. All right, so John is just going to add another Kitchen Finks to his side. It's going to bring him up to 20. Todd's going into his turn four. Let's see if he has a play. He has some powerful four mana cards in his deck. Chandra, Torch of Defiance, Nahiri, the Harbinger. And if John was Johnny up Vengeance. against a deck like Jund or uh, Jeskai that's looking to Snapcaster bolt things, uh, like John would be having a field day with Voice of Resurgence, Kitchen Finks, Kitchen Finks. But against Todd's deck, Todd has a lot of exile effects. He's got Anger of the Gods. Uh, you know, he's got that Journey to Nowhere. Red and White, it's pretty good at exiling things. So this is uh, certainly coming up a rather poorly for, for John. And now this Nahiri being a solid one for one. Yeah, since it does exile. It's going to get rid of the tapped Kitchen Finks. John Tan is going to attack Nahiri with his other Kitchen Finks. It's going to kill it. Wow, you know what's something that I hadn't realized about Todd's deck that I love? Is he doesn't have Path to Exile. Yeah, there's actually no Lightning Bolt, no Path to Exile. He has Lightning Helix instead. Yeah, I'm not sure how much I like the no Lightning Bolt, but I, I hate Path to Exile. I think that card is awful. I know, I know that that is not the conventional wisdom, and people are probably flaming me on Twitter, and the Twitch chat is exploding, but... Well, John Tan has another Kitchen Finks, number three. And all Todd can do is Wrath of God to shrink them down to two ones and pass the turn. Ooh, Tian has found his fourth land. Maybe we'll see some collected company action here. It would be good. I don't think there's any reason for Tian to do it now, or John to do it now. 
I think probably the best thing is for him to wait until the end of the turn, or end of Todd's turn. Burning Catacombs is going to find an untapped Temple Guardian. It's going to knock him down to 22. We're going to oh, get an, Anna, this is an great. Anafenza. Nice. And then that's going, and a Viserys here, so that's going to allow him to... Yeah, so that's going to allow him to bolster onto the Kitchen Finks. He can gain as much life here as he wants. Todd is going to keep playing it out because he does have Emrakul in his deck. So he can try and deck John Tan. Mm, yeah, he doesn't have any way to mill John. So I don't know if that's... Well, if he can kill all of John's stuff, he can just discard Emrakul. Just shuffle everything back in and just, like, never play Emrakul but discard it. And John can just naturally die from decking. Yeah, but that's going to take, like, the entire round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, ooh, I like the infinity symbol. Looks like the eight fell over. And John does get to scry. So it looks like he's probably just going to go find a blood artist and put it on top. Yeah. Okay, so currently John is at 1 billion life, facing Todd Stevens at 16. Who do you think's winning? Probably. <laughs> Come on, Todd, you can do it. <laughs> so Anger of the Gods would be good here. Ooh, there's the Wrath of God. And this gives John an opportunity to maybe scry something different to the top, if he wants. And we will play on, despite John being at one billion life. Yeah. He does have a rally, which gets back both, can get back both Anafenza and, I mean, for five mana, he can get back the entire combo. And Todd Stevens does have a lot of Planeswalkers in his deck, and... Despite having infinite life, we do see situations where some Planeswalkers have ways that they would be able to kill John if they ultimated, but I don't believe that Todd Stevens is playing any Planeswalkers that would be able to do that. So not 100% sure what Todd Stevens is playing here, but I'm excited to see. Well, technically, John announced 1 billion life. Yeah, so not our, infinite. But our counter doesn't go that high. Yeah. So we can... We can now it's one billion and two because mm -hmm. he gained two life off of the kitchen finks entering the battlefield again i don't know i think if i was in john's spot i would have just gained another billion life in response to the wrath of god just because i could i'll go to two billion yeah two billion there's the johnny vengeance it's like he's going to keep oh he's going to lightning helix the kitchen finks yeah might as well just keep the board clear so finks will die todd stevens will go up to 15. And the ultimate on this Planeswalker is destroy all the lands, which is, you know, good or whatever, but... It's not two billion life. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, here's the Collected Company. It would be pretty amazing if we just saw Todd Stevens naturally deck John. Oh, wow, is that two, two? Knight of the Reliquaries? That's going to be two Knight of the Reliquary. Like there are wow. three and he, lands in the graveyard. And you know what's insane about that is John only plays one. Or, excuse me, John only plays two. Excuse me. Yes, he, only he got plays both two. of them. I was like, wait, no, no, yeah. no. <laughs> There's two. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, not, one knight is going to attack. It's going to kill off the, uh, the Johnny Vengeant. And I believe the reason that he's keeping it untapped is because he has cards like Horizon Canopy that would be able to be a, uh, a good redraw. Oh, there is the Nahiri. It's going to plus. Discard Emrakul. We've mill plan engaged. Yep. Mill plan is engaged. So it looks like Todd is just making the statement, you can never kill me. But if Todd is basically looking to essentially only play one game this match, uh, he still has to worry about the clock. Yeah. Okay, so th they're going to use the dice to represent how many lands are in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Another thing uh, about what Todd is doing here 
is he's getting a chance to see more cards out of John's deck. Uh, John is playing a little bit of an atypical brew. And this is a good way for, for Todd to get a little bit more information so that he can sideboard a little more appropriately. All right, so John has one copy of Blood Artist in his deck, mm -hmm. which is going to be what he's looking for to try and drain Todd Stevens out. This deck is kind of crazy. Yeah, it is. He's got a lot of uh, unusual, well, I shouldn't say unusual numbers because because it's a Rally the Ancestors and Collected Company deck, you, uh, you're going to be able to find a card if you want to see it. So just having two of something means that in any long game, you're probably going to find it pretty frequently. Yeah. All right, well, on Tot's end step, John is just going to use his Night of the Will Quarry to get rid of an Overgrown Tomb, Run Catacombs. It's going to fetch. And Night of the Reliquaries can get pretty big pretty fast because of their ability to sack a land, search for a fetch land, sack that to find another land. Yeah. Uh, and it's completely possible that John can sort of kill Todd from a relatively high life total. Yeah, well, both of these knights are now 7-7, seven, seven, so they're, they're both lethal on that um, Nahiri. John has to imagine that Todd has access to Path to Exile, but we know he doesn't. Yeah, I wonder if John just cracks his fetch land and attacks Todd with both, or if he does try to send them both at the Nahiri. If you want to play around a removal spell, it makes the most sense to send both of them at the Nahiri. Yeah. And if you think that there isn't a remove spell, it makes the most sense just in them both at Todd. So we'll see uh, what John wants to play around. This one swept Heath is going to go get a Godless Shrine. Now, it's also important to note that if you have both Malira and Anafensa when you combo, mm -hmm. you, can in, you can bolster infinitely. Mm, I like that. So that is another way just to like one shot kill your opponent. Mm hmm. So wow, it looks just, like John just went for the kill. He is just going to attack Todd for 16. <laughs> and John Tan is going to take game one here with his Abzan Rally deck against Todd Stevens' Sun and Moon. Uh, well, you went to 1 billion life mm -hmm. and then killed Todd Stevens. So let's take a look at his player sideboards and see what options they might have. On John's side, he has four Loxodon Smiter, two Lost Legacy, two Fulminator Mage, one Surgical Extraction, one Engineered Explosives, one Dark Blast, one Abrupt Decay, one Spell Skype, one Quasali Pride Mage, and one Collective Brutality. What do we think John's bringing in? So I doubt John knows exactly what he's up against, so what exactly he brings in is probably a little up in the air. If he's worried about Anger of the Gods and Lightning Bolt and Helix, Loxodon Smiter you can, is something that you can make a solid argument for. Uh, engineered Explosives can be a way to deal with uh, cards like Blood Moon uh, and potentially uh, Chalice, but he didn't see either of those cards. Abrupt Decay, also for the same reason, um, and Kasali Pride Mage, just to sort of hedge against whatever Todd could have. I also like Collective Brutality. I can agree with that. Now on Todd Stevens' side, for Sun and Moon, we have three Rest in Peace, Three Stony Silence, three Leyland of Sanctity, two Blessed Alliance, one Ravenous Trap, one Anger of the Gods, one Oblivion Ring, one Elspeth Sun's Champion. That's a good card. Yeah, I like that one. How do you think Todd's going to sideboard here? So I think he's going to bring in the rest in pieces to just deal with the Kitchen Finxes and the potential of the infinite combo. Also really good against Rally the Ancestors, although he hasn't seen that yet. Uh, Blessed Alliance could come in, although... John is attacked with a lot of small creatures, so Blessed Alliance won't be at its best. Anger of the Gods, though, is going to be great. Oblivion Ring is going to be quite good, and I think Elspeth Sun's Champion is going to be quite nice as well. Now, I do believe that Todd Stevens made a pretty deep run with this deck in Milwaukee, mm. the last Modern Open. And if you didn't happen to catch that, and you know, in your downtime want to learn a little more about the Sun and Moon deck, why don't you head on over to the StarCityGames.com YouTube channel where you can find all of our archives. So Versus Series, Commander Versus, Magic Online playtesting, Best of SCG Live and much more. Like if you want to watch me get blown out by absurd hmm. red cards that's where you can find that. And now... Ooh, I'm going to tune in for sure. And now we'll have archives for the new Split Second Daily Show uh, that 
uh, SCG Live has been putting on in-house with Jeremy Noel. Uh, you can subscribe today at youtube.com slash Star City Games. It's absolutely free, and there's just a ton of content there. So while our players are finishing up their shuffling here, what do you say we learn a little more about the second best dressed man on the SCG Tour besides Andrew Boswell, Todd Stevens? He's 30 from Denton, Texas, five open top eights. Uh, doesn't have any wins yet. He played Division I college tennis at Robert Morris University, which, by the way, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen I I, I read something. Robert Morris University actually has an eSports like program. Oh, really? That's they super have, like, sweet. Like an arena that they've built where they uh, have like competitions. The future and, like, is here. Like for, for people to like that makes me practice so and happy. Stuff. They like actually have an esports program, like varsity players, JV players, coaches, all the whole nine. That's it's, great. It's pretty awesome. Uh, he refuses to wear a hoodie or a pair of sweatpants, and he's also a high school math teacher. And we see time and time again, people who are good at math do well at magic. So you kids in school, you stay in school and you do your math homework. And he also likes to like put on this facade that he dresses nice and dresses well mm -hmm. and it's like helps with, with the whole mindset. But I've watched him stream and he is in just like a full on shirt and tie and dress pants. <laughs> he just walks around barefoot. He, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's pretty good. Todd Stevens, you got me confused. Mm -hmm. Hey, so one thing worth mentioning about that last game we watched is we were basically talking about how Todd Stevens was drawing dead as soon as his opponent gained infinite life. Uh, but John doesn't know that. John doesn't know if Todd has some corner case way of, uh, you know, winning from that scenario. So by Todd playing it out, uh, he didn't waste a whole lot of time. He used up a little bit of his clock, but he got a lot of information about John's deck. And he keeps John in the dark as to whether or not Todd is actually dead to something like a billion life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely like just not scooping, yeah. getting as much information as you can. You do have to be mindful of the time. Mm -hmm. So like, I think once we get to around the 30 minute mark there, if it doesn't look like you're going to be able to miraculously win this yeah. game, then you can try and you know, scoop it up and head on to the next, but. Yeah, but I mean, John doesn't know what, it, what he's up against. Who knows, Todd could have literal millstone in his deck. Yeah, especially, you know? especially in game one, you want to glean as much information as possible and leak as little information as possible. Mm -hmm. Looks like Todd is going to keep his opening seven, but John Tan is going to go down to six cards with and his I believe Absan Rally deck. John Mulligan the previous game too, which he did. Uh, I have to imagine that this deck is relatively consistent. Uh, it just has a lot of cheap creatures and just a medium amount of mana. So I have to imagine most of the hands are keepable. So I'm curious as to know if he's really just getting unlucky here with bad hands or if he's trying to mulligan to, to specific cards or if he's saying, I want an exceptional seven card hand and I'll settle for basically whatever once I get to six or, you know, I'm curious as to what his mulligan philosophy is. Oh, let's see if John Tan can find a six that he's happy with. He does, he's going to scry, let's see if he keeps it on top. And this deck does look it like bottom. it has kind of a good beatdown plan. I'd mentioned this before, but there's three Triad Militants. That, that creature is, is for attacking. It is for attacking. Both players are going to have tap lands. And John Tan looks like he has Lost Legacy in his hand. It's in his sideboard. Interesting. So, yeah, that is definitely out of the sideboard. Oh, there is a Rest in Peace. John Tan is going to use a windswept teeth on his turn. Let's see what he's fetching up. Well, if Todd Stevens couldn't beat one billion life, he probably doesn't need to worry about it in uh, this game. <laughs> At least not so long as that rest in peace is in play. Yeah, that's one of the things that I really like about Todd's deck here is it gets to play two of arguably the most powerful sideboard cards in yeah. all of modern, rest in peace and stony silence. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, a deck. And then Blood Moon in the main deck. <laughs> yeah. I have a, uh, a deck building binder at home where basically I just have all of what I think are the best modern cards, you know, sorted by color. And a lot of times I'll just be flipping through the pages, figuring out, you know, do I want to try to brew something? And when I get to the white section, I just look at the rest in peace and it's like the biggest draw to playing white. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tien does have a Voice of Resurgence. 
On Todd's turn, though, he is just going to Lightning Helix it, since it technically never hits the graveyard. And it's not going to trigger, and there will not be an elemental token. Yeah. John would still get the uh, trigger, though, if Todd had cast it on His turn. John's hand. So it was smart of Todd to use that instant basically as a sorcery. Ooh, Lost Legacy. What are we naming? Wow. Yeah, we got to pick that one up and read it. So he gets to name a card and then look, at, look through Todd's hand, library, and graveyard and exile all copies of the non-artifact, non-land card. And then for each copy that's exiled that's in Todd's hand, he gets to draw a card. So it's cranial extraction for non-land, non-artifact cards. But en any ones that he hits in Todd's hand, Todd gets to draw a card for each copy. So which is the version of this card that uh, was around during Abs and Company and Standard? Or the, uh, the, the, yeah, the Rally the Ancestors card. There wasn't a version. There wasn't? No. Okay. Maybe I'm thinking. That's why that deck was so good. <laughs> okay. There was no way to interact with it. So it's the same, it was the same as Memoricide, which was in like M13 or something. Okay. I think that's what I'm thinking of. And so it looks like we're going to name Nahiri the Harbinger. And all four of them are going to be popping out of Todd's deck. And so that Emrakul is going to be stranded. Emrakul, yeah. Chandra Torch of Defiance, along with Journey to Nowhere and a Lightning Helix. If Todd can draw a land and start working that Chandra, though, ooh, that's going to be tough for John to handle. Yeah, I think what's most important about this Lost Legacy is that John gets to look through Todd's deck and just see what's going on. Uh, I think the information is going to be pretty important for John to sculpt the game plan in this particular situation. So granted, getting rid of those Nahiris is valuable. Uh, the, the information is quite valuable as well. Oh. Whoa! Well, that, well, that's not a land, but it is a Blood Moon. And that's game, folks. Uh, let's see, John has two forest, one swamp, one plains in his entire 75. And now Todd just wants to draw. Oh, and John draws an abrupt decay here. So Todd is just wanting any land so yeah, that he to can cast play. Chandra. Ooh, and there's Chandra. the forest. There's the forest. Jeez. That turns on Collected Company. Wow. And this is one of the... Oh, Antian has a, has, has a swamp already. <laughs> we couldn't see it from the foil up there. Oh, man. Well, this is, uh, you know, one, uh, one Haymaker deserves a, a return top deck yeah. from the other side. Rup Decay is going to hit Blood Moon. Now this is pretty brutal. So we ideally... We might even just see a fetch for a basic planes here. Yeah, ideally John would play something that wouldn't die to the Chandra if he can, or uh, is essentially a sacrifice to it. And I think that's what this is. Lightning Helix is going to take care of the scavenging news. And to note, you know, we had mentioned how Rest in Peace meant that John wouldn't be able to win by, with gaining a billion life, but it also really hoses Knight of the Reliquary and scavenging news. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Voice of Resurgence. Yeah, Rest in Peace is very, and Eternal Witness. It does so much. Rest in Peace is very, and Blood Artist. Like, Rest in Peace is just real good against yeah. this. Abzan Rally deck. I almost, I almost Todd does need to draw more than three lands to be able to win, though. Yeah, I almost wonder if it would have been worth it for John to abrupt decay the rest in peace instead of the Blood Moon, considering he had a forest and a swamp. Well, he's just going to play a Night of the Royal Quarry and pass. Ooh, oh, and there is and the Todd fourth land. Todd gets the fourth land. So this Night of the Reliquary is out of here. It's very likely it's just going to die to Chandra, Torch of Defiance. And Todd has, like, Gideon in his hand, Journey into Nowhere, so we can just start playing multiple spells with the plus from Chandra, giving him mana. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people about this Chandra, and in the Jun deck specifically, I still like Chandra Pyromaster better, but in Todd's deck, I really like this new version of Chandra. Uh, I think it does a lot of good work uh, killing killing just any random body that you need to is going to be really good. Yeah. It looks to be very, very good in Todd's deck. 
And it looks like Todd kind of has a stranglehold on this on this particular game. He's got the rest in peace in and Chandra holding down the fort, and Todd still is going to have more more plays coming up. There is a Loxodon on Smiter out of the sideboard for John Tan. Yeah, and I kind of like Loxodon and Smiter just in general against red decks because uh, a lot of the red stuff deals three damage. The things you're most worried about are typically Lightning Bolt, Lightning Helix, and um, Anger of the Gods. Well, there's another Chandra. Maybe it's probably worth it to play it. Maybe he just plays it and uses it to kill the Smiter. Yeah, I think so. I like that. Pass the turn back. It's basically like he zeroed his Chandra to kill a creature. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Fulminator Mage. That's going to cut Todd off of some mana if he decides to just use it right away. Yeah, I don't know if he wants to use it right away. I think I would prefer to save it so that you can potentially attack this Chandra. Mm -hmm. And then if Todd tries to use a removal spell on the Fulminator Mage, then you can sack it. Against control decks, Fulminator Mage is kind of a three mana 2-2 two -two with Hexproof. It's a little more complicated than that, but it plays out in a similar way. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, Gideon? All right, I take it all back. He should have killed the land. It was obvious. Gideon Jura. <laughs> Although, to be fair, Chandra's Plus does give, it, give him mana that he could have just used to, yeah. to kill John, to, to start dealing damage. And this right. is real tough. Let, let's read the Gideon. We haven't seen him in a while, but... Gideon is very good. Great, great card. <laughs> I I remember this card being in standard. It was, you know, it was printed when I first came back to the game, Ooh. and uh, I lost this game a lot. Hot take. Yeah. In a vacuum, what's better, Gideon Jura or Gideon Ally of Zendikar? Uh, I'm gonna go with Ally of Zendikar just because it's cheaper. Fair. <laughs> Ooh, Blood Moon. I think they're both great, but I wouldn't mind a little Blood Moon here. I mean, at this stage, what could really go wrong? And basically, Todd just wants to, you know, he's like the noose constrictor in this matchup. You know, he mm -hmm. set up this prison, and now he's wrapping around his opponent, just tightening slightly more and more. We'll have to see if John is like that uh, National Geographic iguana that escaped from like the 40 snakes that has <laughs> been floating around on Twitter and stuff. That video was awesome, by the way. Oh, here we have an Anger of the Gods. Pretty costly Anger of the Gods. It was basically land, Anger of the Gods, Simeon Spirit Guide to kill that Fulminator Mage. But it does allow Todd to get aggressive. Ooh, here's a collected company. Todd's attacking with his Gideon. John Tan is going to collect it company. And now it's likely that John is going to be able to kill the Chandra on the crackback. We'll see what he gets. It looks like there's a Kitchen Finks and maybe a Dryad Militant. Oh, would love me a Dryad Militant right here. Can you beat that card? I can't beat that card. Ne I don't think anybody can beat that card. Never. It's too strong. It's green and white. Yeah, you can't Sunlance it. Mm -mm. <laughs> can't Sunlance it. All right, we're going to get a Kitchen Finks and a Dryad Militant. That's going to bring John up to 15. He still gets to block. Yeah, I don't think he wants to, though. All right, not blocking. Going to fall to nine. Kitchen Finks, uh, as a chump blocker, doesn't do nearly as well when there's a rest in peace in play. All right, so we're just going to kill the Chandra and deal two damage to Gideon, maybe? So I don't think that John really has any way to deal with this rest in peace. Yeah. I think that since I, I since we're, since you don't play anything there, I probably would have activated the Vault of the Archangel just to gain five. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like the life totals are going to matter here. All right, well, Gideon is going to minus two and destroy a tapped Kitchen Finks, and because of Rest in Peace, Persist is not going to trigger because it never hits the graveyard. And Todd is just working with the full grip. John basically needs running collected companies from here. 
And, uh, you know, he's got some pretty weak draws. Like a Viserys here off the top of the library here is pretty close to a blank. Uh, he's just going to pass the turn back. Todd's going to activate his Gideon Jura. Attack for six. That's going to knock Tan or John Tan down to three. And John has one Abrupt Decay, which he already used, but he also has one Kasali Pride Mage in his sideboard that he could bring in to potentially tag this rest in peace and maybe get something going. It looks like he's got it. Yeah. Wow. So that's why we didn't use Vault of the Archangel. It's because of the Blood Moon. Yeah. I apologize. So a Pride Mage is going to be able to get rid of that rest in peace. Or the Blood Moon. Yeah, I have to imagine you would go after the Rest in Peace. But it looks like he's going to go after the Blood Moon. I kind of like going after the Rest in Peace here because he already has well, a he, lot of his mana online. He would have had to just like block and then use Rest in Peace. Yeah. Or got, get rid of it. Who lost Legacy. Maybe he's just trying to... Get, like Maybe he just knows he can't win the game from this point or it's real rough to win. So he just wants to cast the Lost Legacy to get some more info. Well, he already cast it once, right? He Just a little he refresher. He through that deck real fast. Yeah. Just want to refresh. What would you name here? Uh, I feel like I would name Elspeth Sun's champion. Probably saw it in the first time. I was going to name hmm. Lightning Helix. Wow. And a backup Rest in Peace and a backup Gideon on the table. Yeah. And Brutal. another and another Blood Moon. Jeez. <laughs> John's like the guy in prison who's trying to like saw at away at one of the bars, and then he saws one away, and the the prison guard just comes and solders one back on. Yeah. Or you just like get out of one cell into another cell. Yeah. <laughs> like you're oh, trapped man, in a cell on, inside really? a cell. Cellception. All right, Gideon is going to activate an attack. Will be chumped by Anafensa. Here's a Blood Moon and a pass. And as Todd fought it out as best he could in the first game, John is in the second game. Oh, yeah. But we will be on to a third quite soon. To the end. And there's that Viserys here I was talking about. Right off the top. Right off the top. Activate Gideon and attack. All right, I'll block. Get to scry. Does he get to scry? Isn't it dies? No, it's you sacrifice. Okay. Ooh, voice of resurgence. Just more blockers. All right, anger of the gods. You're done. <laughs> All right. We could only play that game for so long. Basically, John was just hoping to rip some collected companies, you know, buy time until he draws one of those and maybe he can start getting some traction in. Especially considering the Gideon was only at two. Yeah. So. But pretty exciting. I don't think either of the players are really going to be making. Any changes? Uh, I think that John has some better information, so uh, he's probably the one who, if anyone makes some changes, he will. Um, like Full Man Order Mage, for example, I don't think is going to shine particularly well in this matchup, but. Um. Yeah. Smiter actually didn't look all that bad. It did require a Chandra. Yeah, to and be there's, able to handle it. there's Anger of the Gods. Anger of God's Lightning yeah, Bolt. Looks. Like, one of, your, one of your best ways to beat a control deck, especially when you don't have enough card advantage to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, is to just try to make it so that they have the wrong removal spell for the wrong threat. So you just want to play some threats that are going to be able to survive against your opponent's removal. I agree with that. I think they're already both on track to have success and as we head into game three here let's take a quick break and just talk a little bit about these sweet t-shirts you can get at t-shirts star, star oh the tom ross so we saw tom ross and his blue steel earlier pick up that win over jeff hoagland and this is the official shirt of starcitygames.com superstar th model tom ross 50 percent cotton 50 percent polyester 100 percent awesome 100% boss, 100% USA, and uh, yeah, I thoroughly like these. I like, I like just having swag from companies that I like. Like I have a, I have a Channel Fireball T-shirt. I have a, you know, Pantheon T-shirt. I have some Star City gear. I have some Card Hoarder gear. I mean, I just like wearing 
stuff that kind of like shows my interests. You know, I used to I used to be just a plain black shirt kind of person with no sleeves. Yeah, with no sleeves. Whereas now, now I'm a little more interested in just you know letting people know what's up, letting them know what's cool by by wearing it. Get yours today. Go to starcitygamescom slash apparel. I can't promise that it'll make you play as good as Tom Ross. You can at least try to look as good. Mm. Well, you're going to need a leather jacket. You're going to be able to. We don't sell those yet. Yeah, you're going to need to know how to do backflips. Like, there's a lot of things you got to do to be as cool as Tom Ross. You got to beat people in GoldenEye 64 with your feet. Uh, you know, there's a lot you got to do if you want to be the boss. So we're going to go ahead and come back to the booth here for a little bit uh, while some judges handle some things down there at the feature match. Once we have more information, we'll let you guys know. But in the meantime, we're just going to chat a little bit about Modern, mm -hmm. where we can go from having two decks that kill each other on turn three. To two decks that are doing this, nothing forever. To this, what we're seeing. Yeah. Blood Moon, rest in peace. I have Emrakul in my hand. Nahiri is not in my deck anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, rally the an rally the ancestors. Yeah, rally the ancestors. And what what is ha like like, like yeah. a, what is happening? Yeah, we were we were talking about this a little bit uh, last night over dinner, and I basically uh, you know related it to something like League of Legends, where in League of Legends you've got all of these characters that you can play, and you basically can just pick the one that you think looks the coolest. But they're all good. They all have a diverse you know, set of play styles, diverse ways of, uh, you know, approaching the game. And that's basically where we're at with in, in Modern right now. The field is just so open. You can win, you can play a fast game, you can play a slow game, you can uh, have a deck that relies on individual card quality or synergies. Uh, you know, you can really basically pick whatever you like about Magic as a game and find a deck in Modern that focuses on that one quality, which is, I think one of the reasons why Modern is just so popular is, keep, is because people get to play Magic the way they want to play it, rather than just being forced into playing whatever the best you know, three or four decks are. So Yeah, it, it definitely is extremely diverse, and I agree that you can just play whatever you want. You yeah. have... You know, your, Morf your Merfolk cards that have been around for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. feel free to sleeve them up. Uh, I also like that you get to run into people that have just like foil awesome decks yeah. and modern. It happens in Legacy a lot as well, but not very often you're going to see that in Standard because the yeah. cards fluctuate in price so much, things are rotating. But in modern, you know, things are pretty, pretty solid, nice investments. Yeah. The format's not going anywhere. It's popular as ever. Over 800 people here this weekend mm -hmm. playing modern, which is yeah. just so good. For me, basically what I've done with my collection is I've gotten standard cards from drafting or playing in tournaments, and I habitually just sell all my standard cards that aren't modern playable, mm -hmm. and then just keep the modern stuff, because like, modern's just such gas, and it's just great having the cards. It really is. And to help you get those cards, you can get some sweet money from playing in these opens. So let's Your take bridge game is on point. So uh, let's Jeez. take a, let's take a quick look at the prize payouts for the event. So this is what these people are are battling over two days for. First place, you get five thousand dollars in cash, which is a nice little payday. But you also get thirty SCG points and an invitational invite. S second place, two thousand dollars and twenty five points. Top four is a thousand dollars and twenty points. Top eight is five hundred dollars and fifteen points. Top 16 is 325 and 10 points. Then it goes down to top 32 and then even pays out to top 64. W with events that are about this size, my guess is going to be that X and 2 is going to go down to like 69th, maybe 71st. It's going to be a sad couple so, players. So that like if you make day two in a large event like this, mm -hmm. there's really only like four or five people that usually aren't going to cash. Yeah. Which, which means like you should just stick it out to the end and keep battling. Mm -hmm. But... You got to have a pretty fun. bad day for that to happen, <laughs> you know. Uh, don't worry, it won't. You viewer out there, don't worry, it won't be you, for sure. Uh, we can ac actually look at one other thing. Mm -hmm. So we keep talking about this players championship. Uh, you know, keep talking up all of the players that are in the hunt for their spots at the end of season three, the top three point leaders for the season. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the top three players at large on the yearly leaderboard will also be invited. But let's see who's already in the players championship. Oh yeah. We definitely have 
uh, a list here. So Max McVitie won our Season 1 Invitational, qualified for the Players' Championship, along with Jeff Hoagland, Jerry Thompson, and Andrew Tangem. Liam Lonergan won our Season 2 Invitational and qualified along with Tom Ross, Andrew Jessup, and Kevin Jones, who, are her, who were our three seasonal point leaders. And Jim Davis is invited back to play again since he is our current Players' Champion. He won mm -hmm. last year. So the last seven slots we have are going to go to the Invitational Champion in Atlanta, December 2nd through the 4th. The three That's going to be me, by the way. So, the Man, I hope that would be <laughs> awesome. The, the three uh, top point earners for Season 3 through the Invitational and then the three top point earners at large. And we went over some of that earlier uh, in the cast. Um, Joe Lissette, Brad Carpenter, and Caleb Shear, along with, or actually it'd be Joe Lissette, Caleb Shear, Todd Stevens, along with Brad Carpenter, Ted Felicetti, and Jaden Klomperens is what the qualifications for those spots would look like if we cut it off right now. Yeah, and one thing that I'm gonna be excited to see is, uh, you know, the the teams and how they do, because basically we've got three metagame gurus players in there and one uh, card hoarder member in there. And then also we have the, uh, like, you know, Tom Ross and... Um, Jerry. Yeah, like they're part of that Roanoke crew who aren't really a team, but, you know, they're are, all... They are a team, but they're not really yeah, a team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so... They're just more like a collective. Yeah. Uh, brutal. Well, they are pretty brutal, but... Uh, <laughs> But I'm excited to see just how the teams do, because as people organize themselves into teams more and more, it's exciting to see you know how that really helps players just you know bring out their A game and, and helps them rise to the top. So I'm curious to see you know which which teams are doing the best essentially. So well, let's go ahead and hop back into our feature match. Uh, now that everything is all finished, it appears that uh, a few of Todd's sleeves are. Worst for the wear. Oh, Been using rough. them for quite some time. Got to change uh, those sleeves. So, uh, no, no pattern, I believe, is uh, mm -hmm. what the situation is, and he just has to change his sleeves after the match. Yeah. Since we're not gonna make him do it literally right now while he's mm -hmm. playing a match. So, those Triforce sleeves are cool, and Todd loves them. He's been using them for a while, time to get a new set. Yeah, I mean, he probably just used them at the last tournament he played in and didn't re-sleeve. And uh, while that's not, you know, some sort of cardinal sin, uh, you know, if the judges notice that the sleeves are a little worn, you know, it's just due process to go through and check them. You know, Todd's make a great sure player. There is, make sure there isn't a pattern. Make sure right. there's nothing malicious. Right. And uh, even though Todd Stevens is a player that we all you know, love and trust, he, uh, you know, it's just due process to, you know, go through this stuff. So that's why we had that delay. So John Tan is going to be on the play here in game three. Todd's on the draw, and it looks like Todd is going to take a mulligan to six, while John is going to keep his opening hand. And so this is kind of like justice. I mean, John Mulligan did the last two games, right? That's true. It's true. What goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. It's all zero sum, right? Uh, well, I think they'd have to play a fourth game for it to really balance out. But I mean, it's, there's next round. <laughs> yeah. And then it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. Keeps going. All right, so what I really want to see from John is just a good, aggressive creature curve backed up with like a Rally the Ancestors or Collected Company to play around a sweeper. And then from Todd, I I'd really like to see like a turn one Blood Moon or something like that. He has He has the potential to do... Uh, some of these powerful things ahead of schedule with uh, Simeon Spirit Guide. He also has um, Chalice of the Void, which is something that we haven't seen yet. And I'm curious if it's something that maybe he boarded out on the draw but brought back in on the play. Yeah, I think that at this point he probably, you know, he thinks after seeing that Dryad Militant, he can put put John on like no, no mana dorks. Mm -hmm. So it, it's possible he just took them all out because they might not yeah. be very good here. Mm -hmm. And if Todd does have them, John would have seen them uh, earlier. So like when he when he was able to search through Todd's deck. Okay, so both players are just going to play a little draw go action here for the first turn. John Tan though does have a Quisali Pride Mage that he's going to put on the battlefield and that's going to give him 
some uh, insulation against Blood Moon or Rest in Peace. Yeah, it's, it's certainly good. It's a little scary to lead off on because that means that whatever, like if Todd has any removal spell, it's going to get tagged. But, um, you know, just being able to play it so that it doesn't, so that he can deal with a Blood Moon should it resolve is pretty important. Because the Krasali Pride Mage, it only needs colorless mana to activate. Mm -hmm. As does Engineered Explosives. So John Tan is going to play a Razor Verge Thicket for his turn, and then get three different colors of mana and play an Engineered Explosives for three. So he'll be able to snag any Blood Moon that Todd decides to put on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And the other thing worth mentioning is that hopefully John has some sort of plan for a Rest in Peace because the Rest in Peace, I think, is actually what dealt more damage to John's game plan than the Blood Moons. Oh, and there is a Rest in Peace for Todd Stevens. Here we have a Basic Planes. Todd is down to 17 after our, um, the attack and using his fetch there. That said, John doesn't have a whole lot of pressure. He didn't do anything on turn one. He didn't add any power and toughness onto the board on turn three. So uh, hopefully John has like a collected company or something like that. That's like what he, what he really wants to follow up with here. All right, so Todd is going to use his Anger of the Gods. That's going to take care of the Pride Mage. John is going to play a Knight of the Real Quarry and pass back. And now it's Todd's turn. And this is a turn where if Todd can manage to sequence um, two spells on this turn, it's really going to put Todd ahead on tempo. Uh, but this Chandra is basically like two spells in a turn because it's going to deploy something into the board and kill what John has on the board. So a very powerful play from Todd Stevens, swinging things in his favor. All right, so Chandra is going to come into play and minus to try and deal four damage to uh, the Knight of the Royal Quarry. And it would be amazing if John had some way to save this Knight of the Reliquary. Doesn't have a cycling land, does he? I don't think those are legal. Mm. Or like a crop rotation? Wrong format, right? Yeah, wrong format. Okay. <laughs> He's just fetching in response. Mm -hmm. All right, and there's a collected company, so that's going to be quite good. All right, he's just going to pass the turn back to Todd Stevens. And, and there's there the Blood, the blood moon. moon. So Blood Moon's a little weak here because of that uh, engineered explosives. Ooh, is that a gemstone cavern? Yeah, Chandra plus That's one. That's pretty cool. Going to hit a gemstone cavern. That will deal two damage to John. So if Todd doesn't have any instant speed removal here, he basically needs to just play out his stuff. But if he doesn't have any instant speed removal, John's going to be able to use this collected company uh, to its utmost effectiveness. Okay, so collected company is going to happen on Todd's end step. Looks like there's a couple Kitchen Finks. There is. So not nearly as good with that rest in peace in play, but still, still getting two bodies for one card is quite valuable. It's going, going to bring John Tan up to 20 life. All right, Kitchen Finks. Looks like they're both going to go at Chandra to play around a removal spell. And one thing that John could have potentially done was play a Rest in Peace. Uh, excuse me, to play a Voice of Resurgence and then send one at Todd and one at uh, the Planeswalker. And that way, if Todd had a removal spell, it would have triggered the Voice of Resurgence. But I think. Um, John didn't want to play it because he was worried about something like Anger of the Gods. Well, I mean, any removal spell is going to be the same as Anger with the, the Rest in Peace in play. It's like the, the voices are all going to die. Well, but the <coughs> voice has a little bit more utility on the board rather than Eternal Witness. That's true. So not, not by very much, but, <laughs> you know, by a little... Well, Anger is going to come down from Todd, sweep up the board. Tian does have another Kitchen Finks. 
And this really seems like a nightmare matchup for John. He has all these creatures that are resilient against destroying removal, but not the, all the exiling removal that Todd has in his deck. Yeah, Todd just has a bunch of exile removal. You know it's probably a really good matchup for Todd, Stevens? Dredge. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons he's been working on the deck so hard. Mm -hmm. Although the rest in peace are in the sideboard. Right, there are two Voice of Resurgence yep. and a Windswept piece. So John Tan is now Hellbent. Todd has a grip full of cards. Yeah, and it, it really is the rest in peace that's doing the most damage. <coughs> I would have liked to have seen, uh, and, and I mean like the engineered explosives, it didn't, I don't know if John needed to play it on that turn. I think sometimes people get so caught up in being afraid of Blood Moon that they forget they can potentially just fetch some basics and play around it that way rather than using a removal spell. Mm -hmm. I know one of my favorite things to do, like one of the things that brings me sheer joy when I play Magic is when I thought sees my opponent, see a Blood Moon, and say, okay, I can just ignore that card from now on, now that I know it's there. Yeah, just fetch you know? your basics, be able to play your spells. Right. Because if you look at the game state 10 turns in the future, sure, you had to play out your, your cards maybe one at a time, because you only had one or two basics, but you were able to completely blank your opponent's Blood Moon and save your Abrupt Decay for something more relevant. Right, well, here is a Loxodon Smiter for John Tan. Banishing Light's going to take care of it. Man, and, uh, John would kill for a Tranquility. Yeah. And this is the, uh, you know, essentially the, the sampler of Exile effects. Ah, uh, so it actually looks like the Banishing Light's going to take care of the Engineered Explosives, mm -hmm. which, which makes sense. It's the three mana would be able to take care of it. But, yeah. now, but now that leaves Todd free to land a Blood Moon. Here's another Smiter. And Anger of the Guys isn't going to do it. Todd needs... <laughs> Keep, are, him, keep him coming. All are we, the four different. Are we missing any exile effects at this point? Stasis snare. Stasis snare. There we go. All right. Smiter's going to crash in for four. It's going to knock Todd down to eight. There's a Malira. And I think what Todd is looking for is another land so he can do something like double anger the gods. Looks like he has Nahiri and anger along with Blood Moon. So there's the anger. We're probably going to see a Blood Moon to lock some off. He's, he's going to take one more hit from the Smiter and hope that he can just use Nahiri to get rid of it. And he, and he just wants a turn where John Tan just doesn't play a threat. Mm -hmm. And he just needs to feign a Collected Company. If John doesn't have a Collected Company here, this game is likely over. But a top deck Collected Company on one of these upcoming turns can still do some good damage. Todd being at four means that this game is actually pretty close despite uh, Todd looking like he has a, such a good board position. Yeah. Ooh, but a Lightning Helix Ooh, is a big pickup there. That is huge. It's going to put him up to seven, remove one of his threats. And this means that it's pretty unlikely that John can top deck a collected company that can present lethal in one turn. He's going to need two turns, which means all of Todd's sorcery speed removal is going to be back online. All right, so we're just going to plus two the Nahiri, not draw a card. And a plus two Nahiri, get rid of Simeon Spirit Guide. Use Journey to Nowhere on the Smiter. The, old, the popper stand out. I love it. Journey to Nowhere. Love it. Just a pile, a Journey pile of... Journey to Nowhere, Banishing Light. Just a pile of stuff. Love it. All right. We might see an Emrakul here. Oh, an hello. An Emrakul. And then it goes back into his hand at the end of turn. Yeah, because you want to cast it again later. Well, he has another Nahiri, mm -hmm. so... He can just discard it next turn. Yep, rinse and repeat. Make so, you sacrifice six mountains. Mm -hmm. Which makes drawing Collected Company a little harder. But he does get to keep his basics, and that's pretty important. 
And you can see in this game, Blood Moon just really isn't doing a whole lot. All right, go ahead. And unfortunately for John, I think this is going to be pretty close to game over. Oh, it'll be exiled. Oh. All right, well, we're just going to have to plus this Chandra three times. Mm -hmm. Plus the Chandra. Take two. Wouldn't mind casting that. That's an Ajani card. Those cards are good. He doesn't quite have four mana, unfortunately. Not this turn. So I wonder if there's anything to ultimate for. No, Emrakul's the only creature that he has. Mm. So oh, John no, he, no, he could have ultimated for a spirit guide and just won the game there. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been classy. That would have been real good. Super classy. I'll have to ask him about it when he comes over later. But Todd Stevens is going to pick up this match. Two games to one on Sun and Moon over Abzan Rally. He's going to move to 6-0. and oh. Congratulations, Todd. Go buy some new sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty sweet match. Little, little bit of a slow match. It wasn't, it wasn't one of our sweet, fast and furious, you know, turn three wins. But it was a... Uh, it was pretty cool to see those decks in action. Both